You can't get more experience in civil engineering than the guest that I have for you today. Jim Rowings, VP at Kiewit, has went to school for civil engineering at every level, up to a PhD. He's traveled internationally to work on mega projects in his career, early on in his career. And now he does a lot of work in learning and development as the chief learning officer at Kiwit. So Jim's gonna talk a lot about professional development as a civil engineer, the key things you could do to build confidence and grow. And he's gonna share some pretty cool life lessons that he's had in a very long and successful career as a civil engineer. Let's jump in with Jim. But first, a word from our sponsor. Before we go on here, I'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, Tensar International. Check out Tensar Plus, the award-winning design software for construction professionals to design with geosynthetics and calculate their value on projects. Tensar Plus is simple to use with a powerful engineering system at its core. Whether you're designing a crane pad or need to build a temporary road over muck, the cost, time, and carbon savings can be calculated making comparison with alternatives simple. Whatever you're working on, Tensar Plus is your toolbox for success. All right, now I'd like to welcome my guest on to the show for today. Jim Rowings is a VP at Kiwit for technical development, and he's also the chief learning officer. Jim, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. No, I'm happy to have you and uh, happy that you're able to join us here. And uh, maybe we can start off, Jim, and you can share with our listeners a little bit of your, you know, your journey from your background as a construction engineer to your current role as a VP at Kiwit. Well, it's a winding path. Um, I started out and graduated uh, from school at Purdue uh, back in the mid '70s, and I got an opportunity to uh, to go and work in Saudi Arabia for uh, uh, the uh, major oil companies over there uh, who were part partners with the, the Saudi government. And I started that and got some very unique construction experience early on. It was uh, opportunities to work on large scale uh, petrochemical projects. Uh, and one of those, the last one I worked on was uh, the new, new thing at the time was uh, LNG and it was liquefied natural gas. And it was a large plant uh, expansion in Saudi where they took the gas that they had been flaring off, just wasting it, and uh, turn it into a liquid and were able to export it and then use it for uh, industrial purposes there. That gave me an opportunity really to, um, to learn firsthand large scale project management. Uh, I worked with some great folks there and uh, uh, gave me a great opportunity. I, I knew that at some point I wanted to get a graduate degree. And so after about three years, I had an opportunity to go back to school. And uh, I uh, I went back to Purdue and got a master's. And that was my goal at the time when I went back. But then an opportunity to do some teaching and work on some research. And I found that really interesting and uh, challenging. And so I stayed on. And I had a PhD at Purdue. And I, I was really working in a new area. It was energy use in construction. So modeling uh, energy as it's used in construction. It was at a time when we had an oil crisis in the world. And so it was meaningful in that way. And um, I worked on that and got my PhD. And then I, I chose to take a career in teaching and research. Uh, again, I got a great opportunity to go to the University of Kansas with a startup program in construction engineering and management there in both civil engineering and in architectural engineering. And I found that um, a great opportunity because I was able to work with architectural faculty as well as civil engineers there in, a, in developing a new program. Um, again, opportunities come along, and after four years, I got an opportunity to, to move up to Iowa State to the, you know, notably the number one in construction engineering program in the country and to head that up. And uh, so I did that actually for 15 years and really enjoyed that. Opportunities to teach, get involved in uh, meaningful research, uh, application research with the Departments of Transportation, with the National Electrical Contractors Association with various organizations, uh, public and private, 
And, um, and that really uh, opened my eyes to some other challenges that might be out there. And along the way, as you do in academia, you get an opportunity to take a sabbatical. And I took a sabbatical a little different than others. I, I took one with a, a, a contractor in the state of Iowa there uh, who was very forward thinking. And um, I basically tried out the job of um, learning officer with them for a year and worked in that uh, field uh, in industry to help put together their training and development programs. And so then when I came back to Iowa State uh, after a year, I think I was prepared and I had opportunities come along. And, and the one, the best one by far, I, this is a dream job, was to go to work for Kiwit. And so I, I left academia in 2001 and I joined um, Kiwit as vice president for organization development. And uh, in that role, got to work with uh, recruiting and uh, uh, developing uh, talent within that company. They were in a big growth mode at that time. And um, and that led to other opportunities with Kiwit. And then eventually, uh, after uh, working uh, in a, a business unit with Kiwit also, uh, trying out some of the new concepts of talent development, I came back to the uh, headquarters office. And that's when I began work as a chief learning officer and uh, really focused on developing Kiwit University. And so uh, I would say that's one of those signature things that I have in my career. Wow. That's, there's a lot there, obviously, um, and a lot to unpack, but let's, we could dive into it a little bit here. I mean, I think the one thing that I'll say right off the bat that I really like about Jim's path is a lot of civil engineers today go to undergraduate school and then maybe stay at school and get a master's degree and then maybe work their way out into industry eventually. And, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. That's one pathway. But what I like about Jim's path is I always am a big believer that if you get in the field early on in your career, you really learn what civil engineering is. You get to see it. You get to see things happening, which is which happened to me as a surveyor, ultimately helped me as a design engineer. But I think secondly, Jim, what I really like about what you did is you got to see some aspects of civil engineering, <clears throat> in your case, construction related and then kind of make a decision in terms of what type of master's degree, what discipline of civil engineering might be best for you. Because I think what happens in a lot of times today is I know a lot of people I talk to, hey, I want to be a structural engineer, one type of civil engineer in college because they just are in classes like advanced structural steel and different things. And they like the class, but they haven't experienced the industry and projects with that type of engineering. And then they might go and get a master's and they haven't even really tried it in the real world yet. So would you say that, you know, getting that experience before selecting a master's degree was kind of helpful for you and kind of picking the exact direction you wanted to go? Absolutely. And I, I affirm everything you've just said. I think it gave me insight. Uh, I, I'm going to say two things. It gave me insight and confidence to do a lot of different things and to find out what I enjoyed the most. And the aspect that I enjoyed the most actually was, and I realized this, was building people while building projects. And I, unless I'd had that project experience, unless I'd been in a unique situation where I was challenged, and I can only tell you I was challenged beyond anything I could have imagined when I took the job. And I am a person who over my life, I've developed the courage to deal with challenges. And I think that was an important part of that. It also helped me and gave me, informed me about the specific classes that I wanted to learn more about, where I wanted to go into more depth. And the, the Purdue opportunity gave me a, a chance to actually pick and choose those things. So my master's degree was half taking courses in the Cranert School of Business, finance, accounting, all those MBA type things, and half going into a lot more depth in advanced asphalt, advanced structures, all of those areas, geotechnical, all of the areas of civil. So I built my, uh, my strength in understanding certain aspects of engineering. And the problems that I faced when I was overseas, and I had to figure these things out on my own, gave me insight into where did I need to learn more that the undergraduate 
degree really set me up for success to go and continue to learn. But the classroom, the labs, the great instructors that I had at Purdue when I came back to the graduate school really answered a lot of questions. And I was very motivated to learn. Again, I understood why I wanted to learn more depth about certain things from being informed from the industrial experience. Yeah, that's great. And I would say if you're a if you're a civil engineering professional out there, or if you're a you work for a firm, you know, and you're you're charged with developing your civil engineering professionals, definitely considering when they go for that master's and what what it's in, you can help and guide them with that. I think that'd be very beneficial. And one thing I want to go back to that you said, Jim, which to me is one of the most important things of career development is confidence. And I do believe that it's critical for anyone's success, especially a young engineer that's trying to kind of feel their way out in the industry. And so you were kind of thrust into construction, which to me is my wife is a geotechnical engineer. I know she worked on a lot of construction sites. I know it can be very, very challenging because you have all these laborers around you and the contractor wants to move quickly. And here you are as a young engineer, kind of maybe in the middle of the crosshairs of everybody. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, those, those your first jobs kind of in the field and you mentioned confidence. I'm sure there were some challenging times on those projects that you had to navigate, but just take us back to that experience of how you handled that and navigated some of those challenges as a, as a, as a new engineer out of school. Like, how did you build that confidence up? Well, I, I think I realized that I made decisions because I had to make the decisions. I was given that um, role. And while I probably wasn't qualified for all of the decisions I had to make. I knew I needed to learn and use every resource around me uh, in terms of also a lot of people that worked for me who knew a lot more than I did about things. And I was able to listen, ask questions, and then through that, you know, triangulate to what I knew would be a good answer. Might not be the best answer, but it was a good answer, and it was going to protect the public good. It was going to uh, meet the goals of the the project and move things along. Now, we didn't need to be perfect everywhere. We needed to uh, make sure that we were moving the ball in a positive direction all the time. And so, working with that kind of a mindset and learning to listen to other people was really the important piece that I learned in those first challenges. There were times when I had to listen to myself. There are a lot of ethical situations that I ran across out there. It's a different working world in the Middle East than it would be here in America. And I, I had some good mentorship back when I was in school that reminded me that I'd have, I'd face tough decisions. And you know, I, I got into all those decisions. I had people offering me things that I needed to turn down. And you'll laugh at this, but probably the biggest lesson I learned was one time I took a bag of oranges, two kilos of oranges from a little contractor. And later I realized I had to uh, dismiss the contractor from our project for lack of performance. And I realized the, the mental cycle that I went through because he had made me a friend with that bag of oranges. And you, you quickly learn to disseminate. It's easy to turn down televisions and cars and all that stuff, it's a little harder to recognize those small nuanced things where you're drift, you could potentially drift. And so I've become very attuned to that. And I, you know, I, I think that's something to share with young engineers coming out because they're going to face those situations. They're going to face situations where they see and they feel something isn't right, but they're not sure and they need to act. And if they don't, it doesn't feel right, then you go against it and you make sure that you build your confidence through that decision and you learn from it. Sometimes you may have been overly cautious, but I'd rather be that way a little bit than to take a chance and, and have anyone harmed or, you know, have, have a, a significant failure as well. Yeah, no, that's great stuff. And I think the, the one thing about that that's important is, exactly what Jim just described, those kind of situations with a contractor or things of that nature. You, you just can't learn them in a textbook. You just can't learn them in school. The only way to learn them is to be on a job site and interact with people. And that's why every civil engineering 
organization, whether you're in design, construction, whatever the case may be, you really have to make an effort to get your interns, young engineers onto job sites, take them on guided tours, get them out there, let them do some basic tasks because yeah, you have to put them in that atmosphere for them to be able to really build their confidence um, or else it's just going to become difficult for them. And it could really knock them down in their career development because one or two bad experiences can knock someone back in their development quite a bit. And then they have to build the confidence up again. So I would really recommend that you try to do that. And I want to, along those lines, Jim, I want to talk to you a little bit about mentorship, mentorship and and career guidance. Those are essential aspects of professional growth. And I certainly want to hear from you a little bit about how that's impacted you in your career. And what I also want to end up with here is, I know I talk to a lot of project managers today. We do a lot of project management training and learning and development for organizations. And I always interview their project managers. And they always tell me that the mentors is what helped them to be great project managers in their career. So any advice that you could have around this as well for organizations on how to you know, incorporate it into their learning and development programs, I think would be helpful because I think it's it's necessary, but it's not always easy for a younger engineer to ask for mentoring or for ask the guidance from their organization. So, so share with us kind of your experiences with mentoring and how you think we can, you know, make it more available to younger professionals. It, it really begins with a, a pull from the individual engineer to recognize that they want and need the mentorship and that these these people that you're given the opportunity to work with are all potential mentors for you. You can learn different things from different people. I learned um, and I had a wonderful group of people that I would now consider my mentors, yet there was no formal mentoring program established when I worked uh, the first job in, in the Middle East. I had folks that I was mentored uh, you'll laugh at this, but I was mentored over breakfast on a Friday morning, which was their Sabbath out in the Middle East. And, and interestingly enough, they were a, a British fellow that worked for me that was a project director on our project. But I would go over and join he and his wife for breakfast. And I'd bring bacon because I had a bacon pass in Saudi Arabia. It's not something that is uh, and everybody gets out there, but I was blessed with getting one of those. So I'd go over and I'd, I'd cook breakfast with him and I learned from his experiences. And, you know, I didn't ask direct questions about what I should do. I just let him share his experiences in situations. And I developed that trust and we developed a trust back and forth. That helped. I had a, two people that I worked for out there as managers who were exceptional. They were looking out for my success and when I say that, they were willing to give me some direct, hard uh, criticisms when I needed it to, you know, I can remember one day being told, hey, your job is to get the job done, not to break the contractors on this job. So let's figure out how we're going to get them to do what you want them to do because they want to do it, <laughs> not just because you tell them to do it. And, and it was just some little sound advice like that and then you try that and go wow that worked pretty well they, they're pretty sharp and then that opens up more channels to share things you're going through and and open up with the challenges you're facing and not to be afraid that you're not going to them for every little thing but you're willing to share where you're confused or you need help and i think that's incredibly important for young people today the challenges come across a lot of different ways and you, you take those inputs, you're still responsible for your decisions after you get that input. But it's nice to get that and to triangulate to get it from two or three people that you bounce an idea off of. I found that incredibly useful because sometimes the answer is in between what individuals tell you. Hmm. Interesting. So Jim, what I've found in working with a lot of engineers over the years is that what great engineers do is they're able to have a really good background of technical expertise, but then they're able to develop their soft skills, their leadership skills, and they're able to balance the two. Talk a little bit about your experience in doing that yourself and trying to balance your technical background. Obviously, someone who's done a lot of research, you've been in education, but then also you know, building up your leadership skills and trying to balance those two. Talk about that from your experience. Well, my experience has been primarily that I use... Um, I use situations to learn a lot about leadership. So I try to look at a situation and understand 
what would be the actions, possible actions that you might take that would work here? And what have I seen other people do that have been train wrecks? And what have I seen other people do that that worked out pretty well? So I trying to build those observations and experience from that. And that's why I listen to stories that mentors tell me, because you can learn a lot without having to experience it for yourself firsthand and, and kind of get at through a lot of questions, what's going on there. On the technical side, I think, you know, that lends itself to being curious. And I really believe that that's probably one of the most important traits of, of all engineers is to have a curiosity is and asking that question why or why not in some cases as well. Uh, do certain things work? And then to try to get at the people that have that deepest technical knowledge in that area and understand it. And I, I tell you to this day, I'm still building my technical expertise. It just has moved in different, different areas. It's moved into AI maybe and machine learning into some newer areas, but you have to just keep learning the technical to keep up with it, as well as kind of understanding the latest research in one area or another uh, that's going on. And so I read a lot. I mean, that's my curiosity drives me. And sometimes I read it and I go, interesting. I don't know how I'd use that, but you never know. You never know when that's going right. to pop back in or, or something would come in with that. So I think keeping a balance between the two is very important. Keeping involved technically is important, even though you're a manager, asking the questions and letting other people teach you continually where they have technical depth is important. And you learn how to ask those questions in a way that it's not yes or no, or what do you recommend, but why. The why behind it is where you learn a lot more. Um, and, and of course, you can continue to ask that chain of whys to dig deeper uh, if you'd like to. No, that's that's great. And it's it's refreshing to hear Jim say that he's still developing his technical expertise, because those of you that might be listening on the audio only version, I'll let you know that Jim's not a recent graduate. So he's been he's been doing this for a little while. And the fact that he's still developing, it, you know, really speaks to what we believe at EMI, which is continuous development from the day you start your career to the day you decide to maybe hang up you know, retire and you want to keep developing and then you'll probably start developing other skills. So it's definitely a great life lesson to, to continue to do that. And, you know, developing these leadership qualities, Jim, they involve traits like relationship building, gratitude, professionalism, curiosity, and again, continuous learning. So just talk a little bit about how the leadership qualities have really played a role for you in, in your career advancement and your ability to lead teams effectively in some of the roles that you've taken. Well, I, I think there's the relationships is is the hinge point in this that keeps everything tied together. And it's really important to be able to build and establish those relationships and to keep them because that allows you continual access to new things that are going on or to go back to people and um, relive some experiences and get different perspectives on it. So the, the relationship is, is by far the most important. I mentioned curiosity before, and I mean, that drives everything. That's kind of the, uh, uh, the secret sauce in all of this is to have that wired in that you're curious about things. Um, I would also say that in strengthening relationships, gratitude is extremely important. I, I really believe in that. And I believe in writing thank you notes, handwritten thank you notes, not emails. Handwritten thank yous are fine to throw in an email. That's that's a minimum. But I think the power of the handwritten thank you note goes a long way to establishing long term relationships. That says I want to correspond. I want to uh, I want to recognize what you did for me. Here is what it was, and here is how I believe it helped me. And again, I want to thank you for that. And that builds an avenue or a channel to go back. That strengthens the relationship in some way, even if you don't always agree with that person or you find yourself at loggerheads for um, a technical matter or a management decision or something later, you kind of get over that um, hump if you've built that relationship with it. So gratitude is extremely important. I encourage all of the young folks that I know, I, I, I mentor a lot of folks in our university programs around the country, students, 
and I give them all uh, a set of 10 thank you cards. And I go, when you go out in the summer and you're working in an internship, when you get back, get an address. You know, it's okay. Send a thank you note to a craftsman that you worked with who taught you something about how they build the work. You would, you never know how that person is going to be uh, important to you in the future to go back and ask a question of, or they may end up being a key person that is one of the supervisors working for you in the future in the field. And you just never know that. And don't worry about it. You don't have to get anything back from that. Take the time to thank them. It means a lot to them uh, that they know that they shared because that means they're going to be willing to share with others going forward as well. So this gratitude is one of those pay it forward things that is so important, I think, uh, out there. Yeah, that's it is powerful. And I try to do some thank you notes myself. I do do them from time to time. And I'll tell you a quick story. And I have a daughter who is in high school now, but a couple of years ago during COVID, you know, all the kids were home, they were doing their school remote. And one of their assignments was to write a thank you note to one of their teachers, thanking them for, you know, teaching them remotely and keeping up with the curriculum. So my daughter wrote the note to one of her teachers and she recently read me the response from that teacher, which basically was one of the teachers saying, you know, I was really questioning whether or not I wanted to continue to teach with everything going on remotely. It's been very stressful. But when I got your thank you note, it made me realize that I'm, I'm in the right place at the right time. And this is ultimately what I want to be doing. So, you know, you don't realize that a quick 10 minute note to someone can have a big impact on their end and, re- and it will help you build relationships, which I agree with Jim is, is the real key to success. And one of the other things that I just want to hit on here, reinforce from what Jim said today, you know, about, you know, looking at the experiences that you've had or things that other people have done around you and kind of noticing, you know, what's quote unquote good and what's bad and, you know, learning from those experiences. I've read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie about a million times. And a couple of things that Jim said today, like, um, you know, helping people to do something because they want to do it, not because you want them to do it. It really remind me of, of the book. It's a great book. But one of the other things that I remember from the book that you know, that, that sparked a memory for me was, I think he might've been talking about FDR where he said he had a journal and every night he would write down everything he did that was good and everything that he did that was bad. And then the next day he would try to do more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff. And so, you know, I think definitely, you know, keeping an eye on what you're doing day to day and what the people around you are doing is really an unbelievable lesson in life, in your career, because, that's your information that you could take and build on, right? If you get bad results, you do something different. If you get good results, you do it again, maybe even do it better. So so there's lots of stuff that we covered here with Jim. And what I want to do is we're not quite done with Jim yet. We are going to now put him on our civil engineering hot seat in just a few minutes and ask him a couple of last career related questions. So we'll come back in just a minute and we'll do that. Before we go on here, I'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep, for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. All right, I'm back with Jim Rowings. Jim is a VP at Kiwit for technical development. He's also the chief learning officer. We've talked a lot about confidence building, leadership in the design and construction field. And now, Jim, it's time for the civil engineering hot seat. You ready? Yes, let's go. All right, here we go. So, Jim, do you have any specific rituals that you practice every day? For example, do you have a specific morning routine or a lunchtime routine or just something that you've done consistently on a daily basis that has contributed to your success? Well, I, yeah, these are sound rather trite, but I always start with a cup of coffee and review my calendar for the day and the rest of the week and even looking into the next week because you have to you look ahead that way. And I found that just keeps me focused as to priorities in there. Uh, I'm a list person, and I'm one of those that I get some kind of a thing happening in my brain when I can check off things on my list. So... I use that. Uh, again, I uh, you have some things that are small and some things that are bigger. Everything on my lists has a due date by it. So I put things on my list and it might not be till Friday or 
Saturday mornings. I still use Saturday mornings to clean up things for the week and or things that I need to look ahead to the next week. So those lists are very important. Um, I clean out my emails every day and I align or, or change deadlines if I need to, to move things up or move things back. I always question if I'm moving things back further because that means that I'm recognizing that I'm I've over committed maybe or something to a, a particular day. So, and I keep some open space in my calendar every day because there are things that come along that you have to do that people, other people are expecting a response from you on. And I wanna make sure I do that. I, I really, I learned this when I worked out in industry, uh, uh, this fellow I worked for the Estes Corporation and um, when I did my sabbatical, he had a thing called Estes Etiquette. And that was you respond to a client within 24 hours, even as to say, I heard your question, I'll have to get back to you on that. And I try to do that is to, is to move things off the list. Partly that way, if I got to delay them or I have to do some research to get them done. But if I can do it in a matter of five minutes or less and get it done, and don't go back and pick it up again. Same with mail that comes in. Just go through mail and sort it into, I can take care of this, I can put my address on this and get it out, those kind of things. I mean, those are really functional things, but they're a discipline that you have. And try to keep some lunchtime open so that you uh, are able to make that for yourself and a little thinking in there. That's so great. that's the rituals I have. Yeah, I think that list thing is is called being an engineer because my wife and I do the same thing. We're both engineers all over the house. We have grocery lists, this list, that list, but, uh, but it certainly makes us feel good to be able to check, check things off. All right. So thinking back on your career, is there one book or an author or a leadership philosophy that you really have grabbed onto that you've really liked and that you've kind of used throughout your career? I know we read a lot of books over our lifetimes, but is there something that sticks out with you that's kind of stuck with you over the years? Well, I would say the one, the first book that I would say really stuck was a, a book that was given to me in a class at when I was back uh, at Purdue as an undergraduate. And I got into a graduate class uh, as an undergraduate. And they actually, this guy had executives in the classroom. So he had a guy come in, W. Clement Stone. And he wrote the book, Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. And he gave us all a copy of it. And I took that, and I read it, and I took it overseas to Saudi with me. And I would reread it from time to time. And finally, I got to a point where I realized I should be sharing that with other people. But I think more than anything else, that book has affected me is to stay positive, to look for the positives in everything. And that positive mental attitude fuels uh, an infectious attitude on jobs as well. And so can do attitudes, if you will. The ability to recognize that there are good things and bad things that happen as well that you have to take away from it. And so I, I, I just think that's one book that is kind of an easy read and kind of an, what I call the airplane book that you can grab and it's still out there. You can read it, and leave it on the plane if you want to for somebody else to enjoy or get something out of as well but or you can give it to somebody that's starting to become a little negative and say hey read this and see if that helps any and you know it's a subtle way to kind of keep passing along that positive attitude that's one that that goes all the way back in there along the way i read a lot of books and i read and a lot of articles as well harvard business review wall street journal all of those things as well so there's a lot of things out there you know and the current things on um uh, the what I would say the modern trends. Last year, I led a book club of some students on um, a book by Scott Galloway that was America in 100 Pictures. Phenomenal discussion book. It's different than anything else because it's just a bunch of charts and pictures about what's going on, but it gets you into thinking about real data, the trends that are going on, and it's very provocative, and you can have great discussions, and nobody's right or wrong in the discussions. They're how they perceive the real data. And I think that's good to getting a balanced perspective. So that's the most, probably the most recent impactful book that I've run across. I'm looking for one right now for a book club for this year. Same way as one of the, uh, a book that just 
isn't a slam dunk. And then, of course, there's all kinds of other things you learn. You learn from reading classics as well. So there's things along the way there. Yeah, no, good stuff. All right. So, Jim, you've had some managers along the way for sure in your career, and I'm not asking you to name names, but if you think back on some of your favorite managers, what were the characteristics that made them your favor? We're trying to understand what makes for great managers in construction and engineering. So what, what stands out from, from some of your favorite managers along the way and what they did? Well, early in my career, it was knowing that the managers were looking out for my best interests, knowing that I had to be responsible for it, but I understood that they were there to support. So they asked a lot of questions and they wanted to understand, well, how did you make that decision? Why did you make, and they were kind of coaching. And, and so they were mentors, if you will, as well as managers. Plus they were good examples. They kept the lists, they had habits, they ran meetings. Well, all of those things that you learn. So early on in a career, it's important that you work for good managers, or at least you see good managers, even if you're not working for one, and you know what the one you're working for isn't doing as well. And don't, you know, you can, you're going to go through a lot of managers in your career. Then recognize that there are a lot of different ways to manage. And I went through a series, and I had some folks that were very nice to me, but they didn't necessarily um, establish clear expectations and goals. And then you'd find out that you weren't quite hitting the mark um, after you didn't hit the mark rather than, oh yeah, that was what we talked about as an expectation. So you're kind of surprised, that's not good. Uh, so you get some bad managers that way too, or you see behaviors that aren't as good as others. And you got to recognize that is what they are. And so you can learn from observing bad behaviors and how it doesn't always work well over a longer term in there as well. Then I had, and I'll, I'll say this, I'm gonna call a fellow, he's currently our CEO. I worked for him. I had an opportunity to work for him um, as we both moved out to Boston uh, with one of Kiewit's divisions. And he was an exceptional one. He found the time to ask what I was, what was important I was working on. Did I need any help with anything? But yet he wasn't hovering over. He wasn't a micromanager, but he understood. His favorite line, sometimes when I did something that he thought was crazy, he would go, you are going to get me fired. It wasn't, I'm going to get fired. He was personalizing it to, he was there and he was going to be responsible for what I did, right? And, and so um, I just, he built a great relationship. He's a great team builder. And obviously that's why, he has been so successful and has moved up the ladder uh, with Kiwit. But uh, he's exceptional that way and continues to be very direct. And, and I think that's an important part of it is that keep focused on the goals of the organization and all of those things. And I see that and I go, well, how did he get there? And you see, you, you, I actually interviewed him one time to find out all the managers he'd worked for and how he learned to do what he does the way he does. And it's a fascinating array of personal things that he did. I mean, right back to, you know, high school sports and things like that. Other things that he's been involved with in activities that he's learned these uh, behaviors, I'll call them, uh, from that. Of course, you want to emulate those behaviors when you see they're very successful. That's great. That's awesome. All right. I got one last question for you here, Jim. We call it the civil engineering career elevator advice question. If you got into an elevator with an up and coming civil engineering professional, you only had about 30 seconds with him or her. What career advice would you give to them in that short period of time? Well, I would say that your career is shorter than you think it is as a civil engineer. It may only be 45 or 50 years, and that's not very long in increment of time, but that gives you a lot of opportunities and chances to try things to have an impact. And that's what you want to focus on is having an impact. Your salary, your promotions, all of that will come along if you just focus on having an impact at the job you currently have and making the most of that and learning as much as you can to do the next job that you might want to do. But again, keep focused on doing the job that you currently have and have an impact. You have a tremendous opportunity to make a difference in our society in the future as a civil engineer 
and don't lose that, don't miss that opportunity uh, because you don't know something, you haven't prepared yourself technically and managerially to take on those challenges. Well, Jim Rowings, VP Kiewit, I want to thank you so much for giving us some great advice here and for spending some time with us on the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thank you so much, Jim. Hey, thank you, Anthony. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Jim as much as I did. To get to talk to someone who's had so much wisdom and so much experience and is willing to just put it all out there is really refreshing. And I think that even though he came up as a civil engineer a good amount of years ago, a lot of the stuff that he talked about is so relevant, right? Really building your confidence early on, getting out there on project sites and learning from the experiences around you is what is critical to career development. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to our channel here. We do put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.